today on the list. This is fun. <laughs> How to transform your Thanksgiving dining table. They're like pretty antenna. Right. <laughs> Plus, mistakes to avoid on college applications. Figure out ahead of time what it is that they're looking for in a university. But first, how anxiety can be helpful for you. It's your life, it's your list, and it starts right now. Hey guys, I'm Christina Guerrero. And I'm Jimmy Rhodes, and a lot of us get anxiety. We worry about something, our heart races, and we can't even sleep. Yes, I have been there. It is unnerving, exhausting, and it doesn't accomplish anything. Or does it? We spoke to a neuroscientist who says if you play your cards right, you could turn that panic into a plus. That's right, how to turn your anxiety into something good is our featured story at the top of the list. Two and a half million years ago, when we were just evolving, we had anxiety. It was a defense mechanism that gave us a fight or flight response and protected us from predators. People want to kick anxiety out the door. The thing is that anxiety is a normal human emotion. You're never going to get rid of it. It's always going to be there because it was there to protect us. Sure. We turn to Dr. Wendy Suzuki, a neuroscientist at New York University, who wrote the book Good Anxiety to learn how to turn this ancient response into an asset. First, she says turn your what if list into a to do list. What if I didn't study for that interview? What if I didn't prepare enough for that meeting that I have to have? It always hits me right before I'm going to go to sleep. I go back to sleep knowing that the next morning I'm going to take each one of those items on my what if list and I'm going to put an action on it. Dr. Suzuki says to make a checklist of your worries and assign a task to tackle each one. This will instantly make you feel more in control and help squash that feeling of anxiety. And the trick is you become more productive at the same time you're turning your anxiety into productivity. Next, give your brain a bubble bath. One of my favorite tools that I've studied, which is the effects of physical movement on mood. She says to take a 10 minute walk the next time you're stressed at work and you'll feel the results. I like to call it a bubble bath for your brain that you're giving yourself every single time you move. That sounds lovely. That sounds <laughs> lovely. So every single time you move your body, you are releasing a whole bunch of neurochemicals in your brain. Dopamine, serotonin, noradrenaline. This is what makes you feel good. Finally, she says create an anxiety toolbox. A little bit of a dose is great. It's protective, it's helpful, but what has happened is because of our society and we have access to scary news all the time, right. we get activated and we get anxious all the time. Collect the tools that help turn down your anxiety levels. They are different for everyone. A technique for one person might be laughter. For another, it might be a massage. When Dr. Suzuki was anxious as a child in school, she learned that tutoring other kids helped her calm her anxiety levels. It also increased her empathy. That is turning your anxiety into empathy and an act of compassion. And I love this because I can't think of anything we need in this world of high anxiety sure. and more empathy. She lists several tools in her book, Good Anxiety, and she hopes you find ones that work for you. It's a mindset shift on this word of anxiety, bringing it from bad to good. Right. So let's learn how to turn the volume down and get it to work for us. The benefits of embracing anxiety are at the top of the list. When people think about Thanksgiving, what comes to mind first is, of course, the food. But in truth, that meal tastes a lot better if you're rocking the harvest season vibe. Jackie Decker is showing us how to create an easy floral centerpiece that'll dazzle your dinner guests. If you were looking to spruce up your Thanksgiving spread this year, look to flowers. The colors and beauty of flowers just make people feel good. To learn how to create a classic Thanksgiving floral centerpiece, we caught up with florist and owner of Create Yours, Tina Nestor. First, choose your fall flowers that she says you can grab at any flower shop. We're gonna start with our ingredients. Our ingredients. This is where working with a florist can help. But if you are on your own, just grab what you think looks pretty. We have a seeded eucalyptus. And I like them because it has the berries, and so to me it's very fallish. Yes. Some lemon leaf, hypericum. Ostromeria, these are really popular. Lots of people love them. So pretty. Yeah. Sunflowers, mini carnations. This is called liatris. They're fun. They're, yeah. <laughs> They're like pretty antennas. Right. <laughs> Some leucodendron, solidago, wax flower, 
and palms. Well, there's different types of palms. These are kind of a cushion palm. Next, it's time to prep your base. So we're gonna start with the floral foams. You can grab one at any craft store, but there are different kinds, so. You wanna make sure it's for fresh flowers. Soak it in water and then pick your vessel. This one, of course, is a little bit more inexpensive. It's just plastic. But you can do anything from a festive cornucopia or even if you have something at home that's a really pretty bowl. Use floral tape to secure your foam, add water, and in goes two dinner table candles. And if you wanted to do one taller, one shorter, yeah. yeah They're sisters, not twins. Finally, it's time to cut the flowers and design the arrangement, starting with our greens. Why do we put greens in first? Because I want to set the frame. We're going for a long and low frame, so trim leaves and then cut away. This is fun. <laughs> Once you get your green frame set, next goes the longest flowers. Now for sunflowers at eye level. But these ones are a little bit wimpy. They're a little bit more of a mini sunflower. So we wrapped floral wire around them to keep them upright. It's okay, you're not wimpy. I she know. didn't mean it. <laughs> then in goes our biggest flowers for some focal points. So we're gonna give it a nice clean cut. <laughs> Fill in the holes as you go to the next size flower down. Make sure you keep it semi-even on all sides. And you don't always have to be exact. Fill the rest of your arrangement with pops of color. Your eye automatically sees red and yellow more than any other color. These are like fireworks. Right, they just add that touch of yellow. For our fall finishing touches, some wheat and silk leaves. This is like the bow. Right, exactly. And voila. Yeah. <laughs> this is something to be grateful right. for. Right, that is right creating a colorful Thanksgiving with a floral arrangement centerpiece. College-bound high school seniors are on the home stretch of making a huge decision, what school they're gonna pick. That choice could have a big impact on their lives, so Teresa Strasser has some insider info on the things to consider before choosing a school. Experts say one of the biggest mistakes high school students can make is to focus only on prestigious big name schools that are pricey and persnickety. But if the student can do a little bit of research and, and try to figure out ahead of time what it is that they're looking for in a university, and then to have a variety of schools that sort of fit that profile, the student will find it less competitive. Jake Tawney, Chief Academic Officer for Great Hearts Academies, is breaking down three key elements that are more important than a big name. For starters, what makes the college distinctive? Every college has its own flavor. Every college has unique aspects to it. The University of Dallas has a wonderful program where almost all their students go to Rome for a semester because they have a campus in Rome. A school like Arizona State University has a very distinctive Barrett Honors Program. Other schools have sports as one of their biggest distinctions. The culture surrounding Ohio State football is very different than the culture surrounding the Benedictine College soccer team. Ask yourself if you prefer a more urban setting or rural. He says you should interview the schools and ask what they think makes them distinctive. It's a matter of trying to figure out what that is and if that's something that is not just appealing to you but actually helps you to meet your goals for those four years on campus and then the years following that. Next, know how your application is evaluated. There are two reasons why it would be important for a student to have full knowledge of the process that a college is going to take them through either for admissions or for scholarship opportunities. One is that it allows students to play to their strengths. Some students might be good at in-person conversations and so if there's an interview that's a part of that process that's a real opportunity for that student. If there's an aspect that isn't their strength they're going to want an opportunity to bolster that. So if the student is good at in-person conversations but not as strong at the essay components. They're gonna to wanna to be aware of that and aware that that's a part of the process so that they can dedicate the time to really making sure that that's done well. Finally, know the graduation requirements. Graduation requirements come in two forms. The first is your general education requirements. They should know whether a school has a set of core classes that everyone takes or whether it's general education requirements where there's some choices on how to meet those. Second, know how many classes are needed for your major. This can impact how many electives you can take. And if you know some of that ahead of time, it can form some of your choices on where to apply and ultimately where to go. Getting schooled on college prep. 
Still to come on the list, how science created a new way to distill alcohol. There is no machine involved in the process. Plus, discover the promise that took a decade to come true. I've known his whole life that I had to share him with the world. And... Bye-bye, boys! Have fun storming the castle! Why the Princess Bride isn't just a sweet love story. Their chemistry is palpable. That's what's next on the list. Welcome back. These days, many companies are making it a priority to run an environmentally friendly operation, and that includes a lot of businesses that make alcohol. Yes, and while it's a noble cause to keep things green, their first priority is delivering something that tastes good. Spirits that are long on flavor and easy on the earth, I'll drink to that. Almost every company is taking steps to be green, and now some enterprising brands are shaking things up in the world of liquor. We're sampling three of the greenest liquors and cocktails available today. Master bartender Gustavo Rojas, host of the YouTube channel Hey Bartender, is starting us out with a Mexican icon, Mezcal Amaras. This is the oldest spirit that is in America. Uh, we're talking about a heritage of approximately 475, 485 years. This one, it is the world's most sustainable mezcal. The entire manufacturing process was designed to have the smallest impact on our planet. 100% artisanal. This means that there is no machine involved in the process of the distillation of mezcal. You can find Amaras at your favorite liquor store. Next, we're popping the top on a can of June Shine, makers of eco-friendly pre-mixed cocktails. We make better for you, better for planet beverages. So we started out making hard kombucha, and then we just started making canned cocktails earlier this year. Forrest Dean, co-founder and COO of June Shine, says everything about their process is green. The number one reason why we're sustainable is we're climate neutral. We take that entire carbon footprint and then we buy carbon credits and offset all of those emissions. Equally important to the June Shine crew was transparency. The leading canned cocktail has about 30 grams of sugar in each of their cocktails. If you turn our can around, it tells you exactly what's in the can. So we use real spirits, real fruit juice, and that's it. Find them in four packs at your favorite liquor store. We'll wrap in the Finnish countryside with Kazkin Korva Vodka. It's made entirely from barley and there's no waste. We have been given nothing but barley and water. It makes an excellent vodka. Kazkin Korva's parent company, Anora, is on a mission to create vodka that leaves no mark on the planet. We want to promote ways of finding new, more environmentally friendly farming practices. This helps us to strive towards our goal of carbon neutrality. They use regenerative farming, a technique that leaves the soil intact, requiring less fertilizer and energy to harvest the barley. You can find it online and in your favorite liquor store. Enjoying a cocktail with a side of love for the planet. Well, sharing is caring, so it's time to spread the word on these heartfelt stories that will remind you kindness always wins. We begin in Arizona, where it's all hands on deck to make David a movie star. A lot of heart, a lot of laughs, and uh, this guy is uh, just destined to be famous. I promised him like 10 years ago that I would make, uh, make David a star. So in September, producer Luke Johnson launched a GoFundMe campaign to raise money that will finance a feature film that will star his brother, David, who was born with Down syndrome. I've known since he was a small boy that this, oh, no. oh since he was a big, yes, strong, yes. strong muscle man, I've known his whole life that he was gonna be just, uh, I had to share him with the world. Their campaign has already raised tens of thousands of dollars, and you can follow updates on the film through their Instagram at David Movie Star, or check out their official website, davidmoviestar.com. Up next, we showcase an app that provides support to those who are blind or have low vision. You might wonder how blind people deal with everyday challenges. Well, normally the answer is simple. We're not that different from you. But sometimes the simplest things can be difficult and we need a pair of eyes. That's where you come in. Be My Eyes is free and connects those who need help with sighted volunteers from anywhere in the world 
who will lend a hand through a live video call. I've been a volunteer with Be My Eyes for over two years. No task is too small or too big. I'm here to help. Give a call. The app launched in 2015 and is now available in 150 countries with over five and a half million volunteers. Learn more or download the app at BeMyEyes.com. And finally, we pay a visit to the Milwaukee Dancing Grannies, who recently put on one special performance. One, two, three, Granny Strong! The group led a parade at Aurora St. Luke's Medical Center, where they thanked the medical team that helped them after the Waukesha Christmas Parade attack last year. Oh my gosh, thank you. The event celebrated the recovery of member Betty Streng, who was severely injured, and also paid homage to the four members they lost. They died doing what they love. How can we not keep on dancing for them? They would want us to be here. So incredibly touching. And those are three stories that show kindness wins. Lots more coming up. Stay with us. We're back, and on today's watch list, it's inconceivable. The Princess Bride is 35 years old this year. Jackie Denker's looking at some of the unforgettable moments in this comedy classic. The Princess Bride. Let's take you back to the magical land of Florin for not your basic, average, everyday, ordinary, run-of-the-mill, ho-hum fairy tale. My Wesley will always come for me. Your Wesley is dead. I've seen worse. The Princess Bride is a cult classic, so prestigious it's even preserved in the U.S. National Film Registry for being culturally, historically, or aesthetically significant. The fact that, you know, 35 years later, we're having a conversation about it, tells you that it's achieved some sort of cultural relevance that's just, you know, sustained itself through the years. Mike Michon, head of the Moving Image section at the Library of Congress, helps us celebrate it with some of the best of what it had to offer. That's wonderful. We begin with its exceptional mix of genres. It's got any sports in it? <laughs> Are you kidding? Fencing, fighting, <laughs> torture. Revenge. It takes those genres at face value. There's just really nothing broad or slapsticky about it. It's a very genial film. It's one of director Rob Reiner's best works that's also considered one of the best love stories told in film. As you wish. Which was brought forth by Carrie Elwes and Robin Wright. Their chemistry is palpable. And real. In his book titled As You Wish, Elwes admitted he was smitten from the first time he saw Robin. Can you move at all? Move? You're alive. If you want, I can fly. They're the backbone of the story. They cause the action, but in some ways, you know, they're almost ancillary. Because it's also the film's outstanding cast that shines, including Wallace Shawn, Mandy Patinkin, and Andre the Giant. And then when you throw in cameos from people like Billy Crystal and Carol Kane and Peter Cook as the impressive clergyman. Marriage is what brings us together today. Really just sort of takes it over the top. Ultimately, every element comes together to make this film memorable, but especially quotable. Now, I think the quote that most people know is Mandy Patinkin. My name is Diego Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. Of course, you know, Wallace Shawn. Inconceivable! You keep using the word. I don't think it means what you think it means. I went to go see this film when it came out, and I think I said, inconceivable, you know, at least once a day for the next two years. <laughs> We're celebrating the cinematic gem that is The Princess Bride. The end. On the watch list. Such a classic, and it's a tell. I like dropping lines into everyday conversation like, oh. you fell victim to one of the classic blunders, and if people get it, we instantly bond. So what's your favorite line from Princess Bride? Ugh, no bonding for us because I still haven't seen it. Oh, KG, you almost made me say a naughty word on TV. I know, well, Jimmy, that would be bad for your career but possibly good for your health. The power of swearing is last on our list. That's next.
Welcome back. It's time for what's last on our list. And KG, of course, I never use harsh language on the air, so viewers might be surprised to learn that I sometimes swear. Yeah, not always, but yeah, you can make a sailor blush. <laughs> yeah, sometimes. <laughs> hey, they're just words, and I say them with love. Right. So, of course, you sent me this article from theconversation.com, The Power of Swearing, How Obscene Words Influence Your Mind, Body, and Relationships. Okay, this article covers a lot of old ground, like how swearing can increase your pain threshold, hmm. which worked for me when I tried keeping my hands submerged in ice water. Yeah, I don't blame you for that one. No, but some of it was new to me. For instance, bad words are stored in the limbic system along with our fight or flight response, which means even if you can't talk, you can still swear. <laughs> well, most interesting of all, to me anyway, these naughty words are imprinted on us when we're kids, and that got me thinking, Jimmy, you have kiddos. What was your take on bad words while they were growing up? You know, I try not to give any big reactions yeah. to the swears, but man, it's hard not to crack up when a toddler drops an F-bomb. Yeah, you know, I <laughs> told my nine-year-old Mateo that he can start swearing when he starts paying the bills, <laughs> right? genius. Right, exactly. Now, my three-year-old sometimes swears when he doesn't catch a ball or something. Mateo, of course, tattles on him for using a bad word, but I just say, no, 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 he didn't say a bad word. He just said fork. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like your three-year-old's a chip off the old block, KG. But just think of the health benefits. That's right. Maybe we'll have to get matching swear jars. And that's what's last on our list. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Tomorrow, the list wants to know, what's your sign? We don't see the future. The possibilities are endless. We always encourage people to bring symbolism, some things that associate what they hope to generate. You have questions. Do you ever wonder who the laziest signs in the zodiac are? The answers are in the stars. It's a mutable fire sign, which means it likes to be on the go. What's your sign? Tomorrow on The List.